And today we're going to hear about religious and theological reflections on climate change and global justice by Dr. Kathy Driscoll. Uh, Kathy received her PhD in organizational behavior and marketing from Queen's University in 1994. She's a professor in the Department of Management at SMU and scholar in residence at the Canadian Center for Ethics in Public Affairs. Her research interests include business ethics, management education, sustainability, and business and religion. And she has published articles in the Journal of Business and Ethics, Business and Society, the Journal of Management, Spirituality, and Religion. And uh, that's correct. Okay, thank you very much. So as you can see, I've added on theologian wannabe. So I am not a theologian. I have very little study in religious studies. I did a minor in my undergraduate degree. And I did take a course at the Atlantic School of Theology. This is probably about seven or eight years ago now. It was a course in Catholic social teaching. And Beth McIsaac was my instructor, one of the best teachers I've ever had. And she really inspired me to dig deeper into the teaching of my church. So I'm going to be speaking about some reflections that I've had on religion and theology in relation to climate change and global justice. So Pope Francis and Laudato Si, I'm going to draw from this most recent encyclical, but he, he, he says that if we're going to really seriously consider how we're going to change the way that we're doing things, we have to include all types of wisdom, all types of language in considering this. In the spirit of ecumenism, we could be looking at things in common between many of the world's religions and what I'm going to talk about today. I've done some work with some scholars who have focused on an Anabaptist Mennonite theology. So as you can see from this diagram, there is a lot of overlap in, and we could also draw on the spirituality and wisdom from indigenous traditions as well. And I think that there is a lot of overlap, and hopefully as I go through the presentation, you'll see some of that. I know I'm going to be wandering around during the whole net conversation there. So, as I said, I am going to draw from La Delta C. So this is the encyclical that Pope Francis wrote last year, came out last year. And I'm also going to make some connections to Development and Peace, which is the official international uh, agency for development in the Catholic Church. So, before I get into all of that, though, I'm going to start off with the reality why we need a climate of change. I'm guessing for a lot of the people in the room, you know more about the science of climate change than I do. So I'm going to go through this piece rather quickly, but humor me, and I think that it does set up for some of what I'm going to say later in the talk. So first of all, we have this sense of a very delicate balance of interactions and feedbacks in our ecosystem. We have a question of population. So we have 7 billion people on the planet, roughly, give or take. But what we have to, and I hope technology does cooperate, I forgot to check how well internet was doing on this computer. But I wanted to show you one interactive graphic that's quite interesting when we look at this issue of population. Some of you have probably seen that. We used to say the word like this, that a country is a resized to represent the true area. It actually looks more like this. But area is only one way of looking at the world. This site gives some others, such as where the people are and where the money is. Mainly though, this site is about climate change. Perhaps the responsibility maps to see how each country helps drive global carbon emissions from extracting fossil fuels and burning them through to consuming the goods and services that result. You can also see historical emissions, most of which are still in the air and potential emissions that are currently locked up in coal, oil and gas reserves. In addition, you'll find some vulnerability maps which show the people most at risk from climate change 
such as those already exposed to droughts, floods and extreme temperatures. Click on a country to see its national data, and if you like, use the shading drop-down to overlay extra information. For example, we can add shading to show where the population is rising in the red area, or falling in the green area. If we then click the emissions map, we can see that the countries with the fastest growing populations currently have released very little CO2. But click to the people at risk map, and we can see that those same booming populations are very exposed to climate change impact. So that's the carbon map. Click around to get a better handle on this crucial but complex topic. And so when we consider how many planets we need, you can see that we're an average on a deficit. But again, based on different parts of the world who are using more of the world's resources and the parts of the world that were mentioned in that interactive graphic about how those are the places that are most vulnerable as well. So here you see the ecological footprint. So you see Canada, the United States, Australia, up in the north corner there. You see Africa, largely, in this bottom left-hand corner. When you look at CO2 emission per capita, there it's Canada's compared to Ethiopia, Honduras, Philippines. And when we think about this, uh, this question, are we living in the Anthropocene? So we have you know, here 4.5 billion years of recorded history, but less than 1% where we are here, and yet this is the first time where human beings have had more impact on the earth, on climate, rather than natural forces. And I'll show you one more interactive graphic. So this is just showing average temperature. And of course, we know that 2015 was even hotter. So you're all familiar with the outcomes. And what we're seeing more, and this is especially evident in the media over this past year, is some of the connections to the social piece. So whether it's the increasing number of climate refugees and the Syrian refugees, we can make connections back to climate impact and resources, people moving to cities. Whether it's the pictures that we're seeing of Beijing and people not being able to go outside, whether it's all the conferences that are be ha being held related to agriculture and drought and impact on food shortages. So they're, they're, we're beginning to see what Thomas Homer Dixon referred to is this idea that when there's trouble in nature, there's going to be trouble in society. So we have this reality, but then we have these challenges to creating a climate of change. So climate change is a wicked problem rather than a tame problem. It's very complex. There are no easy solutions. There are divergent views. People have different ideas of solving things, and it's a slowly evolving problem. So we're beginning to see more of the impact and accept it. Even ExxonMobil is accepting it now, but it's a slowly evolving problem. And there are different things that pull on our heartstrings at different points in time. There's also the influence of technique and reductionist thinking, so we think that we can divide everything up and study these small pieces and individual parts of a very complex whole, a complex problem. So the, and you can think about this in terms of economic considerations in particular. So the economy accepts every advance in technology with a view to profit, without concern for the potentially negative impact on human beings. And this is from a recent article in The Economist. And so what this shows, so we have, this is time here, so up to 2030. And you can see that uh, the, at the top there, I can't reach it, 
but past policies, that's kind of the trajectory for where we're going as far as CO2 emissions. And then the blue is the pledges that were made at the climate conference in Paris. So the, what the countries made, the, the pledges that they made to what they were going to do. But what is most telling is the gap. So you've heard the, the two degree threshold mentioned. And so what you see is that there's a very real gap. And what they're saying is that with the pledges, it's, it's close to a three degree increase in temperature, which there's scientific consensus that this is well beyond what we can handle. And we have, uh, we have our reductionist, again, from techniques, this idea that land is left, that's left wholly to nature is called waste, and we still have this thinking in 2016. Professionalism and instrumentalism, so emphasizing things like efficiency, material gain, domination, individual power, resource exploitation, globalization, control, etc. The language that we use, how we view progress, political influences, I think the diagrams and the quotes speak for themselves. Faulty assumptions in the deified marketplace and the disconnects that exist related to these faulty assumptions. Cheap oil, we've been reading in the media recently about the automobile industry booming because of the cheap oil, cheap gas, and just plain old ignorance. <coughs> so, how does this connect to religion and theology? So, the first point I want to make is that I think far too many people of faith are unfamiliar with the basic teaching in their particular faith religion on social teaching, environmental teaching. So I'm going to start with just going through a, a quick refresher on Christian anthropology. So humanity in its ideal form. So this was before original sin. Humanity after the fall. So by fall we can think in terms of Human beings decided, we can do it better than you can, God. And then humanity after redemption, and as Christians, we believe through Jesus Christ, uh, the goal, but the goal on earth as it is in heaven. And I'm going to come back to that point. And all creation is guided to fullness through God's redemptive power. So before the fall, you get this idea from Christian teaching that there was a balance, there was harmony. So God was seeing a perceived experience in the self and God and the environment, the other. The environment, the other was seeing a perceived experience in the self and God and in the environment, in the other. The self was seeing a perceived experience in the self in God and in the environment, in the other. The environment was treated as partner, sibling, in relation, something to take care of and respect, and of course, all of this transcends our understanding. It's, it's a faith. It's a belief. Conflict did not exist prior to the fall. And the idea of dominion has been misinterpreted. Dominion didn't mean exploit, dominate. It meant to till and keep the land. So keep the land, you almost get a sense of sustainability. Humanity after the fall where the human turns inward, then there's a disconnect. So that's over there. There's a complete turning inward away from God, environment, other, and self. 
So there's this distance and separation, and the harmony that was present is no longer present. So connecting back to some of the challenge with regards to creating a climate of change, dealing with climate uh, change, so first of all, forgetting about original grace. So I think sometimes we focus too much on original sin and not on original grace and original blessing. Thomas Berry warned about this before 2003, but said Christians have been concerned with redemption out of this world, so attached to their spiritual life development or their social mission of reconciliation that they have had little time for serious attention to the earth. So that's one point. And again, the idea of incarnational spirituality says on earth, as it is in heaven. So this idea of the development and the fulfillment and moving towards kingdom or however you decide to call that, it's on earth as it is in heaven. So St. Francis would be the idea of finding that harmony in the way that he had those relationships with nature, with other, with God, with self. The second one is the anthropological errors. The, again, this dualistic and reductionist thinking resulting in the us and them. So it's us against them. Whether them is nature, future generations, global south. So how we think about these things. And then there's the liberal conservative piece. So the Pew Research Center tells us that last year's polls showed that a quarter of Republican Catholics believe that there's no connection between human activity and climate change, and that climate change is not a serious problem. So as McManaman says, these concepts, liberal and conservative, do not really have a place in theology, in church teaching. So Naomi Klein, some of you are probably familiar with Naomi Klein's book, This Changes Everything, or you might have seen the documentary. And if we, if we think, at, you know, and it's not just Sarah Palin who's spouting the, the fear-mongering around end times either. So there, there is this talk of, oh, it's just the end times are coming. And if we buy into that way of thinking, that it really changes nothing. Or if we say it's just God's punishment, I actually know a religious person who, who actually made connections between Hurricane Sandy and being close to Wall Street. So if we start going there, it's just God's punishment, then it really changes nothing because there's nothing that I can do about it. Or, hey, let's just take it to prayer, right? God's got this one. We don't have to worry about it. Again, it absolves us from any personal responsibility that we have to do to change our behavior. So, now, what does the teaching of the Catholic Church actually say about our relationship with nature and the connection between climate change and global justice? So again, I'm going to draw largely on Laudato Si, the most recent encyclical that Pope Francis and his team of scholars, because after all these things are written by a team of scholars, and uh, as well connect to development and peace. So uh, Catholic social teaching, again, just a refresher for those of you not familiar with the, the concept. So it's an application of Christian ethics to social and ecological issues of today. It's rooted in scripture, and the catechism of the Catholic Church says we're obliged in our faith to advocate the protection of the environment as part of creation and to conserve the Earth's natural resources. So these are the themes. I'm not going to go into detail on these themes, but these are the major themes that are found, give or take. In some places you'll find different ones, but quite a few of them do connect to issues such as climate change, and global justice. And when you look back at the many encyclicals and letters that 
popes and bishops and leaders in the church have, and their teams of scholars have put forward. You see, so Pope Benedict actually was the one who talked about this idea of nature is prior to us. So this idea of primordial. So nature was created first, according to, uh, to some of the, the, the creation story. Um, anthropological errors, environmental emergency, forgetting God's gift of creation. We have become tyrants of nature and rebels against God's plans. So this was Pope John Paul II. Canadian Catholic bishops in 2003 made this connection. There was a lot that was always uh, talked about, the idea of hearing the cry of the poor. And it was actually in 2003 when this connection to hearing both the cry of the poor and the cry of the earth was made. Other things that are in there, um, needing to respect integrity, cycles of nature, the idea of interdependence has been in there for quite some time, actually going uh, well back close to the 1970s and 80s into some of the church teaching. There's not an undervaluing of humanity within nature, but nor is there an overvaluing of humanity at the expense of nature in the Catholic social teaching. As well, there is this idea of nature as relation. And here in particular, in, in this most recent encyclical, as well as in some of the other more recent ones, there is this, I see a real overlap between Aboriginal spirituality and indigenous wisdom traditions and some of this understanding as of, of nature as relation. So um, Pope Francis draws on the canticle prayer of St. Francis from the 13th century in using this language, brother wind, sister moon. And uh, there have been other people, you can see 1959, this was a, a Catholic theologian who thought, said, we are part of one family with all nature, we relate as siblings in love and mutual respect. And Pope Francis in Laudato Si draws on the experience, the wisdom, the knowledge of indigenous peoples as well. There's a lot of reference to that in there for, for those of you who haven't read it. Uh, and two years earlier, Pope Francis said this, and, and I really like this one. God is joining the so closely to the world around us that we can feel the, feel the desertification of the soil almost as a physical ailment, and the extinction of a species as a painful disfigurement. And the idea of creation as a gift, this first quote, even the fleeting life of the least of beings is the object of God's love, and in its few seconds of existence, God unfolds it with affection. So I've always, you know, wondered about, you know, those insects that live for, you know, <laughs> like I said, oh, you don't have a great life. But again, you know, when you, when you, you think about these things spiritually and thinking about time, well, who knows what that really is connects to in the whole idea of creation and its fulfillment. Like what role that has. Anyways, when I read that I thought, oh, okay, that, that makes it a little better. Um, the idea of the rhythms, recovering and respecting the rhythms inscribed in nature. And I love some of the references back to scripture that are found in this encyclical. So from Leviticus in the Old Testament, where it talks about the idea of a sabbatical for the land. So going six years, then taking, like some of us academics in the room, get our sabbatical, this idea of tilling the land for a certain period of time, and then taking a year off so that the soil can heal itself. So it kind of exposes some of these ideas. And when I think about how I see uh, where my parents live and how I see some of the land where they're not even rotating the crops according to good science. Or at least the best scientific, scientific evidence. So I'm going to skip to this one. So in Laudato Si, we're, not, we're faced with not with two separate crises, one environment, the other social, but rather with one complex crisis which is both social and environmental. 
So going back to Thomas Homer Dixon's thing about when there's trouble in nature, there's trouble in society. But what, what I think we really have to see is the vice versa as well. When there's trouble in society, there's trouble in nature. So for example, if we think about the pace of consumption, waste, our lifestyles, that these things contribute to problems in nature. So the Pope has said, not just this Pope, not just other Popes, but many people, Naomi Klein would be an example, that this is a moral imperative. So this changes everything. It's time. It's time. So this is a message that's consistent with this teaching as well. So I'm going to stop talking now because I'd be interested in hearing some of the comments from some of you in the room and any questions that you might have. I've, I've put together a few reflection questions that you might think about, but any comments you have on anything I've said so far, I just have two more slides to conclude, but otherwise for the rest of the time, I'd rather hear your, your voices. talking about the possibilities of geoengineering um, that, what, that now people are talking about taking control of the weather and figuring out a science way to do that that will enable us to not have to worry about climate change anymore. So the last few slides have really spoken to that point that we have to accept that this isn't just a science issue that we can solve with technology and it'll be fine. That, that we really need to reflect on how we're living as a species. That's uh, in line with the morality we want to reflect. Yeah. And in, in Naomi Klein's book, for those of you that have read it, um, she really gets into some of the, whether it's the Gates or um, Richard Branson or the, the people that are behind some of the financial support for finding these technological fixes. And when you read about them, I find it really scary, you know, whether they're trying to put things into the atmosphere or trying to suck things out of the atmosphere. But uh, either way, when I think of risk, I just I find the whole thing very scary. When I think th there are alternative ways to thinking about it, and we've, we've gone so far in thinking that technology is going to get us out of all of our problems. Yes, Joanna. I'm almost positive, but I, I saw on the television that the, this changes everything. <coughs> I think it's February the 18th that's going to be shown. I don't want to swear, but they did it. On date. TV? Yeah. <coughs> oh, okay. Before they didn't have a date. But I don't want to say it and be wrong, but it's, it's close anyway. Yeah. I, I've seen the documentary, <coughs> and the book is far better. Far better. That's, they usually are. Uh, I, I think the documentary, like many documentaries, they, they pick the people that they want to hear their voice, but it sometimes come, comes across, I don't know, too long. Same with Inconvenient Truth, if you saw Inconvenient Truth. I think, you know, we could have done that in 45 minutes. More people would have watched it, or they would have not stopped watching it when they got an hour and 15 minutes in or whatever the case may be. But I find that, you know, the book is so well written and you really get a sense of her um, passion and that doesn't come across the same way in the documentary. So, yeah, watch it on February 18th, but read the book. Patrick. Speaking of Al Gore, it's interesting to look at the negative side of his 15, 16 years preaching on that, that politics and the blowback and the dumpers on him and likewise his friends and colleagues. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. And you still see a lot of that in you know the the recent US campaign. It's never ending and all of the surveys and no disrespect for big business. Yeah. 
Any yeah. other comments? Go ahead, Richard. No, I was saying, I think one of the questions that come to mind to me is always um, how can you bring these two together, so the religious, spiritual belief and the messages together with the science or mainstream. I've always found that there's always either you're religious and spiritual or you are scientific, and, and those two can't really be together. And I wonder, if, in your opinion, whether you're seeing a change in that, whether Pope Francis is thinking of changed anything, or to try and bridge that sort of divide between the two. You certainly don't seem to see it in the U.S. right now with the uh, whole political aspect of it. You, you see a huge divide. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, I have the one slide here that just shows a little bit of. Of credit, so the Big Bang Theory was actually discovered, written about by a Catholic priest, and uh, Cousin Theology and Evolution Theory was also here at the Chardin. Um, so I think that there is a history, and not just in the Catholic Church, I think among many different religions and science, I think that blending has always been there. For me, I think the greater worry is related back to you know, some of the statistics that, you know, whether it's the Pew Research Center or uh, other polls, where they show how many people of a particular faith or religion are disconnecting from any of the science. So whether that message is coming from church leaders who are adopting Sarah Palin kind of tactics, or that's just coming from, as Patrick says, you know, maybe there are forces in big business or big government or big government and big business together that are, are blinding people to accepting what their faith actually or their religion is teaching them. Yeah. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's so much the, the science and the religion not being compatible as much as there are these other obstructionist attitudes, faulty assumptions that are at play. Yeah. Not really a question, but I guess more of a comment. Um, I've been struck by uh, people in class. Uh, the young, younger generation is, is almost like a hopelessness or an apathy, but they may be fully aware of the consequences in their future direction. But they see it as hopeless. That, they, that there's almost a belief structure that has to be almost parallel in the sense that they have to believe that their individual actions can connect it and almost make a total transformation of humanity in order to make a difference. And they don't believe. They don't believe that it's possible. So maybe I don't know if you want to comment about it, almost like a secular belief in parallel to Christian belief. <coughs> well, well, what I was going to comment on before you asked the question, because you said you were just going to comment, right, right, right. Right. was that you know even if, if, we, if we go back to you know, where is it? If we go back to slides like this one, uh, I mean I read this and, and I get this sense of real hopelessness, but then. If you read this article in The Economist, they actually make reference to that we can take something out of this that can give us some optimism. So you have, you have that these pledges, even though they're one or one point, they'll, they'll, what scientists are saying is that they're one or 1.5 degree more <laughs> than we can handle, but we, we, we still have time. So this is the, the thing. We still have time to say, okay, we, we've got to change the pledges. So the fact that there are countries that are coming to the table, sitting down and saying, we're going to change the way we're doing things, and we're going to put these pledges on the table, when we compare to where we were five, ten years ago when people weren't even coming to the table, or the people coming to the table were so low down and had no influence when they got back to the real table that it wouldn't be meaningful. So <clears throat> that would be the optimistic piece to say that, okay, 
you know, it's going to take some time to to get people. Like there's there's a real piece, and here's where we might get back to your question. There's a, a, a real you know self awareness. So how do we get whether whether it's students or you know anyone to to somehow come to that awareness that there is a way forward. And how do I individually connect to that? So not to say, the problem's capitalism, capitalism will never change, I don't have to do anything. Or the problem's, you know, the Republicans, and they, I, they have too much power, and I can never do anything to change. Or it's God's punishment, so I don't have to do anything to change. So to get people to see that only by everyone really seeing how they do connect to both the problem and the solution. And so that's, that would be the, the way that I would think about it, trying to raise that awareness and the self-awareness. I wonder if you follow up on that, though. Like, I get a sense that uh, younger generations, and even me, growing up, most of my friends or most of the younger generations, they're not religiously affiliated. You ask anybody, I don't know, you know, maybe not be atheist or anything, but you know, they just you know, practice and serve the church. So then, how do you reach each one? Because I think a lot of things are religious, you can reach message, messages like that to broader audiences and people that are part of that sort of community. But then you have the younger generation, which is that individualism, of, you know, I'm not part of that. And what are they part of? And how do you them as a whole, I think that's also a challenge. Uh, yeah. I, have, Go ahead. I, I have theories around that. I think yeah. that a lot of the gathering that you see in digital spaces now, mm -hmm. that people are looking for their tribes or whatever the terminology is that you're using, that what they're really looking for in that space is that sacredness and communion with others and finding that community that they belong to. And now we just have a broader pond in which we can find our people. Um, and I think you're going to see more of that happening as the, the technology um, matures because people are learning the digital citizenship. We're on, kind of, we're on the rocky shoals right now, but we're getting to the point, I think, where those communities are going to mature and we're going to see real action happening out of them, not just like buttons. Right. Yeah. yeah. And there, there are all kinds of uh, ways that you can um, get people you know, to become more self-aware without, I mean, in my classrooms, I don't bring religion <laughs> into my classrooms. Uh, so, so there are, there are, there are different exercises, different ways of going, pedagogical approaches to go about doing that. Roxanne, you had a point? Yeah, I'm just, I, I'm not as negative as you are, because I teach in this area all the time. But when you look at, you remember the Montreal Protocol, the ozone layer was thinning and we had this huge change where everyone around the world had to cut down emissions, and we did it. The biggest difference is that that was one problem and one related problem. This one is much, much bigger and much more complex. But I think we have an absolute duty to ensure that we get involved in that in teaching, if you're in a teaching situation, that you provide opportunities for students to go obligatory opportunities, because sometimes if it's mandatory, they actually get drawn into it. And so I, I'm not so discouraging, because I think that there is a huge growth right now in NGOs, in our NGOs. It's massive growth around the world, and we're getting a lot of movements from the ground up. A lot of provinces or states aren't waiting until it's legislated from the top. They're doing it from the bottom up. And so I'm, I'm much more optimistic, and I think as things get worse, Service learning is one way. I've used a lot of service learning in my classes and, and to see the students reflect on that and some of the self-awareness and real growth that I see out of those service learning experiences. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> talking with despair and negativity and so on, it was making me think of faithful to charity and this one or people like Thomas Bear and Kev uh, related to St. Paul, right? Faithful to charity. Have they 
adapted or uh, related that to environmental attitudes as well? That I'm, faithful and charity are I'm also not essential sure. for that's when I'd need Anne-Marie Dalton here right. to, uh, <laughs> to uh, really comment on that. He was her supervisor, wasn't he? Does anyone know? She wrote a book on it. Yeah, she was on her book, which is on the ASD Okay, okay. I knew there, there was a close relationship there, but uh, sorry, I can't answer that one. I would like to thank. And that, that's one thing that I found interesting because I was reading... Naomi Klein's book at the same time that I was reading La Gata Si. And to see how both of them really emphasize love. She has a chapter that really gets at love and, and some of these things. And she, she, and she also draws very heavily on uh, Aboriginal knowledge and Aboriginal spirituality and this idea of. Um, Know, arteries and veins and talking about the oil and and just the language that she incorporates into that chapter again drawing from the Aboriginal knowledge and wisdom and it made me see a lot of overlap between the two and I, I have no idea if Naomi Klein has any faith background but I found that that, that love piece was very prominent in her. So, you know, faith, hope, and charity, the grace is love. You know, I think there's something there that, in, in a humanistic, you know, approach for someone who, who doesn't have a faith, a particular faith or spiritual background, that they still would resonate with that kind of language. Um, I think in fairness, we should, I would have to say that at this local level, we have a huge disconnect between uh, Pope Francis and, and our church here. Um, I don't say, in, I can't say which bishop or which priest or whichever, but as a Catholic, um, I think the reason you're not seeing a lot of spillover into, into young people or, or universities or whatever, uh, it's, a, it's all got to come from the NGOs because it's not spilling over from the churches because the churches are either um, disregarding, in, in the main, just disregarding, just sidestepping the, the issue. Um, not, not discounting it, not disbelieving it, no scientific problems, no Galileo, but just not addressing it. And I'm not sure what that is. I don't know if that means that we're more influenced by the, uh, the, uh, the American uh, conservative, what's her name? Uh, yeah, I, I wonder if we are not more influenced by them than we realize, because sometimes when I, I listen to some of the sermons, or, yeah, and, uh, but I'm, I'm not uh, without hope by any stretch. I just have a feeling that, that where before development peace used to concentrate uh, sometimes on mining, sometimes on this, sometimes on that, I, more and more I think this is going to be it for the next ten years, and we're just going to have to pump and pump and pump week in and week out until we get through that and um, and, and then as, as the Catholic Church here begins to come on board then um, hopefully we will get, uh, again we've, we've also got to make much better use of the of technology and, of the, and we have within our group unfortunately many older folk as well although we've hired them here we've got smart with that but, but people like myself are terrified of the computer so that doesn't help in terms of, um, of spreading the word but there was a local movement for a while. Um, when I used to work at Clean Nova Scotia, we had the Climate Change Center as part of Clean Nova Scotia, and they arranged a couple of um, events with local faith groups. Um, Richard Jarowski spoke at one. I know Anne Marie was involved in organizing, I think, both of them with Daisy Kingston. And the first one I know had a really good turnout, and people were kind of positive about it, and, and it led to a look at church buildings and how they could start working on church buildings to make them more energy efficient as a, a direct kind of okay. addressing the, the issue to make it real for people. Um, and I'm not sure what ever came of it after. Well, Emma, Nor Emma Norton at uh, the Ecology Action Center, she actually goes around to um, religious organizations in, well, not just in Halifax, but in Nova Scotia, I believe. And uh, there, there is a program, Green Sacred Spaces, 
Um, you can go to the website and look at it. But she goes in and she gives talks to church communities about how they can do things differently. So there are all kinds of resources available. And even here, I've noticed uh, in the past few months, there have been so many things that I'll just hear about a, a religious community doing something on climate change. There's lots of things that are starting to sprout up. So in the fall, like Johanna, I was a little bit um, pessimistic. Like, this is going to be so slow in coming. Yes, yes. You know, like climate change, a slow, evolving problem, and now we have implementing some things to do about it, slow, evolving. But I'm starting to see some things happening, which gives me hope. I think, I, I will say honestly, the, the fact that the layperson doesn't have to uh, to fight with any scientific stuff, that, that people can no longer say it doesn't, you know, it doesn't exist, that, that is certainly helping people like myself who, who are really very non-scientific, but it allows you to speak to the issue, and so that is, that's also hopeful. Yeah, there's something about consensus, yes. that 98-2, yeah. <coughs> I think it was Arnold Schwarzenegger who said, yeah, not that you know, I constantly quote Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> but I think he was the one who made the, the doctor analogy. So he said if you had a child who was very sick and, and failing, and you saw your child failing, and you took your child to a hundred doctors, and 98 of them said, I know what's wrong, I know what we can do to, to help your child get better. And two of them said, no, nothing's wrong with your child. They'll just progress and then it'll go away and everything will be fine. Who are you going to listen to, the 98 or the two? And so this is the thing with the scientific consensus, whatever it is now, it's probably well beyond 98%. But to have that is, is very reassuring, as you suggest, for people who don't know about the science. Okay, you know what? If it were 50-50... Maybe Sarah, you could have your day, but 98 and 2 or whatever. No, sorry. I have, I have one last comment too is that I think that there are huge numbers of um, uh, disaffected Catholics who don't hit the pews anymore, but who are still quite religious and, or, and definitely moral. I mean, we are basically moral society. And uh, uh, I think that somehow we have to figure out how to reach those individuals as well. And uh, certainly the technology would be part of it, but yeah. per perhaps aiming it a little more, we could afford to be a little more moral in our discussions. The if Pope's we were, doing his job too. The Pope is doing his <laughs> job, yeah. It's, to, it's to, move the, to move from the Pope to... To, to move forward. Yeah, because I think once people, uh, people discuss the Pope, but then they go, there too. Yeah. 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 There's uh, another site that I, I think I linked it in here. Let me just see. Yeah, so this one, CatholicClimateCovenant.org, it, it has phenomenal resources. So resources to help you care for creation. It's U.S.-based, but it has teaching resources. It has all kinds of of things here, you know, equal <coughs> toolkit discussion guide, study and action guide, ideas for homilies, videos, prayer cards. So, and same with development of peace. Development of peace on their website, they have all kinds of ideas for teaching tools and resources that religious organizations. And again, it doesn't have to just be uh, Catholics. So, a lot of the resources on development of peace's website would be very. Um, friendly to even people who aren't connected to any particular religion. And in fact, uh, here's a little shout out. The, um, no, no, no. The, the, uh, the United Church has been our staunchest ally through the 10 days of world development, through whatever. Um, and a lot of them know a lot about the agricultural production, so I run to them and say, uh, you know, tell me about the methane gas and farming. Yeah. Uh, but they have been extremely, extremely supportive. So. Yeah. When Vanda Shiva was here last yes. year, um, it was interesting to see all the different religious communities at that event where she spoke um, for this sewing piece for development.
I have no idea what time it is. My cell phone died and then my watch broke. It's a plane Thank you for coming. A lot of competition on campus today, I know, for different things going on. But uh, I'll leave you with Mother Teresa there. Thank you very much.